Hello, Serious Survivor here. This is part of the Nuclear War, Nuclear Apocalypse Survival Series. This video would discuss the details we could expect from a nuclear blast, the types of blasts, the effects they would have, and the implications this blast would have on us thereafter. Nuclear war and the ensuing apocalypse are a situation resulting in devastation on a level the world has never before experienced. No matter what our thoughts, our beliefs, one day, someone will deem it necessary or strive to take the advantage. One day some leader from some country will push the button, sending nuclear devices of destruction into the air, targeting the densest and heaviest populated areas without much of a warning, with no reasonable means of defense. The world we inhabit and call our own will be reduced to smoldering radioactive ruins in the blink of an eye with a blinding flash of light, changing those who survive forever. So let's look at the nuclear explosion itself. The yield. The yield of a nuclear weapon is a measurement of the amount of explosive energy it can produce. The yield is the equivalent quantity of TNT that would generate the same amount of energy when it explodes. So a one kiloton nuclear weapon is one that produces the same amount of energy in an explosion as one kiloton of TNT. And a one megaton weapon would have the energy equivalent to one million tons of TNT. One megaton is 4.18 times 10 to the 15th power joules. One joule is equivalent to the average size human heartbeat. One bomb with a yield of one megaton could destroy 80 square miles. Ground zero. The term ground zero refers to the point on the Earth's surface below or above the point of detonation. For a burst over or underwater, the corresponding point is generally called surface zero. The term surface zero or surface ground zero is also commonly used for ground surface and underground explosions. The different types of nuclear explosions. An air burst is defined as one in which the explosion occurs in the air at an altitude below 100,000 feet. Also one of the classifying factors is that the fireball does not touch the surface of the earth. A detonation above that altitude of 100,000 feet is generally denoted as a high altitude burst. Airburst and high altitude burst are designed to give the maximum range for the fireball and blast radius. These are also used to generate massive EMP effects and long range devastation. The fallout will be negligible. A nuclear explosion that occurs at or slightly above the actual surface of the land is known as a surface burst. Surface burst on land are designed for complete destruction of a certain area and result in tremendous amounts of fallout, which can make an area uninhabitable for extreme periods of time. Water bursts are designed to impact sea levels, destroy water or coastline based installations. If the explosion happens beneath the surface of the land or water, then it is known as underground or underwater, and sometimes this is called subsurface. Subsurface bursts are generally designed to destroy underground targets such as bunkers and similar. The fireball. The fireball, this is a tremendously hot and extremely luminous or blinding bright spherical round massive phenomena consisting of vaporized air, atomic level particles and weapon residues. This fireball occurs within less than one millionth of a second of the weapon's detonation. Immediately after its formation, the fireball begins to grow exponentially in size. At the same time, the fireball rises proportionally high into the air as it's pushed upward by the forces of the explosion. Within seven tenths of one millisecond after the detonation, the fireball from a one megaton weapon is approximately 440 feet across and this increases to a maximum size of about 5,700 feet in diameter in only about 10 seconds. It is then rising at a rate of 250 to 350 feet per second. After one minute, the fireball has cooled to such an extent that it's no longer emitting visible radiation or light. It has risen roughly 4.5 miles from the point of impact or ground zero. The blast wave. 
A fraction of a second after a nuclear explosion, the heat from the fireball causes a high pressure wave to develop and move outward producing this blast effect. The front of the blast wave, also called the shock front, travels swiftly outward and away from the fireball, and it's a moving wall of highly compressed air consuming everything in its path in an omnidirectional motion. The air immediately behind the shock wave is also accelerated to extreme velocities, creating a very powerful wind. These winds, in turn, create dynamic pressure against the objects facing the blast. The blast winds at sea level may exceed 1,000 kilometers per hour or 300 meters per second, rapidly approaching the speed of sound and air and in more powerful cases, exceeding it. The range for blast effects increases with the explosive yield of the weapon and also depends greatly on the burst altitude. There is an optimum burst height for each yield in which the blast range is maximized. To maximize this desired severe effect for a 1 kiloton bomb is 0.22 kilometers. For 100 kiloton bombs, 1 kilometer. And for a 10 megaton, 4.7 kilometers. So at those heights, we will see the optimum devastation on the surface. If the explosion occurs above the ground, the initial blast wave will strike the surface. And from there, it is reflected off the ground to form a second wave traveling directly behind the first. The first wave is called the incident or shock wave. This reflected wave, the second wave, travels faster than the first wave. This reflected blast wave will then merge with the incident shock wave, or basically the second wave, moving faster, catches up to the first wave and the two become one. This is known as the mock stem. The mock stem wave is small initially, but as the wave continues to move outward, the height will begin to increase steadily. After about 40 seconds, the mock wave from a one megaton nuclear weapon will reach distances of 10 miles. The blast wave weakens structures, which are then torn apart by the blast winds. The compression, vacuum, and drag phases together may last several seconds or longer and exert forces many times greater than the strongest hurricanes ever recorded. Blast effects are usually measured by the amount of overpressure, and this is the pressure in excess of the normal atmospheric value, and measured in pounds per square inch or PSI. After 10 seconds, when the fireball of a one megaton nuclear weapon has attained its maximum size, approximately 5,700 feet across or a mile across, the shock wave front is some three miles further ahead. At 50 seconds after the explosion, when the fireball is no longer visible, the blast wave has then traveled about 12 miles. It is then traveling at approximately 784 miles per hour, which is slightly faster than the speed of sound at sea level. The thermal pulse effects. This energy is emitted from the fireball in two pulses. The first is quite short and carries only about 1% of the energy. The second pulse is more significant and is of longer duration, up to 20 seconds. The energy from the thermal pulse will start fires in dry, combustible materials. Collapsed structures are more vulnerable to fire than intact ones. Under specific conditions, the many individual fires created by the nuclear explosion can coalesce into one massive phenomenon known as the fire storm. The combination of many smaller fires will heat up the air and causes winds of hurricane strength directed inward towards the fire, which in turn will fan the flames and cause the fire to develop strength. For a firestorm to develop, four things have to be present. One, there must be at least eight pounds of combustibles per square foot. Two, at least one half of the structures in the area are already on fire simultaneously. Three, there is initially a wind of less than eight miles per hour before the firestorm begins. Four, the burning area has to be at least 0.5 square miles or larger. The mushroom cloud. As the fireball increases in size and cools, the vapors condense to form a cloud containing solid particles of the weapon debris, dust, chemicals, particles of matter, as well as many small drops of water derived from the air that sucked up into the rising fireball. Depending on the height of the burst, a strong updraft with inward flowing winds, which is called afterwinds, are produced. These afterwinds can cause dust and dirt and debris to be pulled upward from the surface. 
In an air burst, only moderate or small amounts of dirt and debris are drawn into the cloud. For a burst near the ground, however, large amounts of dirt and debris are immediately drawn into the cloud during its initial formation. The maximum height reached by the radioactive cloud depends on the heat energy of the weapon and the current atmospheric conditions. If the cloud reaches the troposphere about six to eight miles above the Earth's surface, there is a tendency for it to begin to spread out there. But if sufficient energy still remains in the radioactive cloud, a portion of it can ascend into the more stable air of the stratosphere. The mushroom cloud attains its maximum height after about 10 minutes. The cloud may continue to be visible for about an hour or more before being dispersed by winds into the surrounding atmosphere while it will merge and disperse into the other clouds that are present. Fallout is the radioactive particles that fall to Earth as a result of a nuclear explosion. It consists of weapon debris, nuclear byproducts, and in the case of a ground burst, radiated soil and particles pulled upward from the blast. Most of this material falls directly back down close to ground zero within several minutes after the explosion, and this is most of the heavier material. But some will travel high into the atmosphere. This material will then be dispersed over the Earth during the following hours, days, and even months or years. Fallout is defined as one of two types. Early fallout, within the first 24 hours after an explosion, or delayed fallout, which occurs days or years later. Also, it is denoted as local and global fallout. Local being the fallout occurring near the blast zone, and global being the contaminants carried and distributed over the long ranges and even globally. This radiation hazard comes from radioactive fission fragments with half-lives of seconds to a few months. Most of the particles will decay rapidly. Even so, beyond the blast radius of the exploding weapons, there will be areas called hot spots, areas that survivors could not enter because of the radioactive contamination from the long-lived radioactive isotopes like strontium-90 or cesium-137. For the survivors of a nuclear war, this lingering radiation hazard could represent a grave threat for as long as one to five years after the attack. Predictions of the amount and levels of the radioactive fallout are difficult because of several factors. These include the yield and design of the weapon, the height of the explosion, the nature of the surface beneath the point of the burst, and the weather conditions such as wind direction and speed. An air burst will produce minimal fallout if the fireball does not touch the ground. On the other hand, a nuclear explosion occurring at or near the Earth's surface can result in severe contamination by the radioactive fallout. Many fallout particles are especially hazardous biologically. Some of the principal radioactive elements are as follows. Strontium-90 is a very long-lived with a half-life of 28 years. Iodine-131 has a half-life of 8.1 days, and taking potassium iodide can help reduce the effects of this. The amount of tritium released varies by bomb design. It has a half-life of 12.3 years and can be easily ingested since it can and does replace hydrogen in many water sources. Cesium-137 has a half-life of 30 years. When a plutonium weapon is exploded, not all of the plutonium is fissioned. Plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,400 years. The details of the actual fallout pattern depend on wind speed and direction and on the terrain. The fallout would contain about 60% of the total radioactivity. The largest particles will fall within a short distance of ground zero. Smaller particles will require many hours to return to the earth and may be carried for hundreds of miles. This means that a surface burst can produce serious contamination far from the point of detonation for extended periods of time. Fallout can also enter into the stratosphere. In this stable region, radioactive particles can remain from one to three years before returning to the surface. Radiation will not only produce damaging but deadly results. The greatest risk of contamination from an explosion is either from fallout or from ingesting and inhaling contaminated particles. A surface burst will almost certainly produce a mushroom cloud, but an air burst or high altitude burst may not produce a mushroom cloud. A surface burst will most likely produce extremely high levels of contamination, while an air burst will not produce these. Knowing the difference between the two can make the difference between life and death, because this can be a determining guideline in whether or not we believe a certain area is safe for exploration or too dangerous from the contamination. Well, that's it for now. 
I hope you found the video informative. I tried to discuss a lot of the details and aspects of what occurs during the nuclear explosion and while we see some of the effects that we see from an explosion, keep an eye on the channel as there'll be many more installments on the Nuclear War Nuclear Apocalypse series. And I know this video was not about surviving the event, but it helps to survive an event if we truly understand what takes place behind the scenes of an event. Then we have all the tools we need to put the gear we have to use and to survive not just this type of event, but any type of catastrophe. So thanks a lot for watching, and for now, Serious Survivor, out.